Hey everyone. I feel bad for uh, not letting you uh, continue your hallway discussions. I think it's. But hey, you have to listen to me, I guess. <laughs> um, good afternoon. Thanks for uh, coming here. Um, my name is Samuel. Yeah, it doesn't show up here. I'm, I'm Samuel Ortiz, uh, and I work for a company called Rebos. It's a stealth mode uh, startup, uh, but the uh, REV stands for RIS5 and O's for open source. And we're doing a lot of uh, RIS5 uh, specification stuff, so maybe you can guess what we're doing. I'll let you do that. Um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, root of trust, uh, silicon root of trust, the hardware implementation of it. So this is, uh, that's a data center, and I, I understand this is an embedded uh, conference, so bear with me, I'll, I'll get there. Um, but this is a, a data center, I think it's a, it's a Google data center, and somewhere there, uh, you most likely, at some point of your life, you've had a workload running there, even though you don't know about it. And um, one really interesting thing would be to be able to verify that this workload is running on top of something that's trusted. Uh, that's a very vague uh, as assessment, but it's basically the equivalent of this. Making sure that your application there uh, runs on a, it, it, it does run on the top of hardware and software junk. What you really want to verify or be able to verify is to know exactly which junk is running on top of. And maybe it's acceptable to you, maybe it's not, but at least you have a way to say, this is the piece of crap that my application is running on top of. The hardware, the software, it doesn't matter, but you have a trustable source that tells you, yes, this is, this is what you're running on top of. Make your decision, okay? So basically, something that tells you, yeah, this, this junk, you might find it okay, but that, that's, that's what you're running on top of. That's called a root of trust, okay? And uh, it's a very m mouthful uh, set of words, root, trust, and uh, if you search for definition of root of trust, uh, well, the, the, I guess the uh, logical place to look for would be the trusted computing group, the TCG. If you look at their root of trust specification, that's the kind of definition that they're going to give you. It's a component that performs one or more security-specific functions, such as measurement, storage, reporting, verification, and or update. Doesn't tell you much, right? Uh, at least not to me. It, I find it very confusing. Uh, they have another part of the uh, uh, definition. They tell you that a root trust is trusted uh, because you cannot. It 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 uh, it, it trusted. Um, uh, it, it <laughs> it's trusted always to behave uh, exactly how you expect it to be to to behave. It's it's also very confusing, uh, at least to me. So it tells you what it's not supposed to be doing. Uh, it doesn't tell you much. Matthew Garrett, uh, I guess I'm expecting many people here to know uh, Matthew Garrett, has a much better definition, in my opinion. Matthew Garrett tells us that a, a, a rule of trust is something, it's a thing that has to be trustworthy for anything else on your computer to be trustworthy. Basically, it's something, it can be a hardware component, software component, something. If you trust that something, you trust everything else on your computer. That's, to me, that's a, that's a much better definition than the, the first two, and actually, I'll keep only that one. So it, it's a thing that's running there in your machine, and if you trust it, you can trust everything else. I think it's a, it's a pretty good definition. So basically, it's a thing on the right there uh, that's capable of telling you, or uh, that's capable of telling you uh, that there is a, a chain of trust between itself and your application. And it's also capable of maintaining that chain of trust. So it tells you this is the chain of trust that, the, this is the, the stack, the hardware and software stack that's running below you. And it's also capable of telling you, hey, someone has changed something there. And this is, this is what's new now. And do you, do you, you want to keep running on top of this? So it's capable of telling you what chain of trust you're running on top of. And chain is uh, a, a chain of software, hardware components. A, a chain of configuration uh, uh, settings, a chain of states, uh, whatever the, the root of trust wants, wants to tell you. And it's also capable of, of maintaining it. So I'm trying to clear things here. Root of trust is, hopefully this is a bit clearer. Let's take an example. Um, this is, well, 
Some people call it secure boot, UFI secure boot, verify boot, trusted boot, whatever. Uh, let's pretend we run this kind of uh, a boot sequence where you have a firmware that loads and verify a bootloader, then then in turns loads and verify a kernel, then then loads and verify your application. You have this chain of nicely set up components that loads thing, they, they verify things, they load it, and then they, they execute it. That's an example where the root of trust here is the firmware. The firmware is the root of trust. Why is it the root of trust? Because if you trust the firmware, you trust everything else on your computer. You know that you're running on top of a, a, a chain of trust and that you can trust each and every one of them. If you trust the firmware, you trust that the, the bootloader that it loaded is verified. And so it's a, it's a safe piece of software to run on top of. And then the bootloader itself loaded the kernel and, and so on. And the trust is, is kind of a, a, a propagate, prop, propagating this way up to your, uh, to your application. So in that example, the, the, the root of trust, the entity that you have to trust to trust everything else on your computer, is the firmware. So let me ask you a question. Let's say your firmware is a, a, an EDK2 firmware. Would you trust an EDK2 piece of software running on, on, on your machine as the, your root of trust? Who would trust uh, EDK? <laughs> Drew says no. No wonder. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of difficult to trust uh, uh, the actual firmware because there's a lot of uh, question of uh, where, where does that firmware come from? I mean, how, how did it get loaded? Uh, what, what keys did it use to verify the bootloader and then the bootloader, the kernel, and so on? There's a lot of uh, questions around this. And in reality, you, you cannot really trust the firmware in, 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 in that, in that uh, scheme. What you're going to do instead is trust is something you have to trust anyways. You have to trust your CPU. You have to trust one piece of silicone which is usually CPU. If you don't trust your CPU, you really cannot trust anything on your computer. So your root of trust in most system, actually, well, most system, is going to be your CPU. Actually, it's not entirely true. It, in the server space, the data center space that I'm talking about, and I'm getting to this embedded thing that I'm talking about here, that all of you have been talking about, but not me so far. Um, the reality is that the root of trust is not the CPU itself. In all those big iron machines that you see, the root of trust is a separate piece of silicon. In Intel's component, it's a 46, 32-bit uh, uh, piece of silicon. It's a CPU that Intel manufactures and, and manufactures for this sole purpose. It's called the CSME. Uh, maybe some of you have heard about CSME, Intel Management Engine. Does that ring a bell? Probably ring a, a lot of bad bells, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but that's, uh, that's what Intel calls the, the management engine. Management engine is actually something that runs there in the root of trust. But the, the root of trust is called the CSME. It's a 40, 486 uh, uh, silicon uh, CPU that runs everything. That it's, it's your root of trust, right? So you, the root of trust of, your, of, of the, all the machines that run in this nice little picture of Google is a 32-bit 486 piece of silicon. That's where the whole trust of your cloud is, is built upon, OK? The root of trust, um, it loads and verifies the firmware, which in turn loads and verifies the, the bootloader and so on. That's, that's not the only thing it has to do. It, it has at least to do the, the loading and verifi verification part, but it also has to be able to provide anyone in this chain a proof of what's happened before it, 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 this, this piece gets loaded. For, so for example, for the application, you, you must be able, as an application owner, to interrogate the, the root of trust and ask for a proof of everything that happened before. And that proof needs to be, it's not just a, a, a proof, it's a proof that is signed by the root of trust itself. So it's signed, typically in, in an Intel uh, use case, it's gonna be signed with Intel endorse keys. So you're gonna, you're gonna get a proof of what the root of trust has loaded and what then the, 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 the pieces that it loaded, loaded again and so on, up to your application, something, and, and this proof is gonna be signed by Intel itself. Right? So the, basically the CPU, something that you trust. So you're gonna get a proof of that because if you don't have that proof, you have no way to verify that the first verification actually happened. You don't know in which state this CPU is. Uh, is it in debug state? Is it in, in production state? Is it in, in RMA? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a state where it's the, the CPU is about to be scrapped. In which state it is? Uh, so the, this proof will tell you I'm in a production state, 
And I'm in, in such a state that I actually did the verification of the first mutable software that is running on your, on your machine. And this, uh, this piece of software, that, this piece of uh, this proof, sorry, that, that is signed by the CPU, it's typically, is, uh, it's typically called, sorry, uh, um, uh, attestation report. Uh, and that's something that the rule of trust must provide anyone in this chain in order to, to actually be a real rule of trust. Okay. It's not, it's, not only, it's not the only thing that the rule of trust actually do in the, the cloud space, in the big iron space. They do, as I said, uh, platform attestation. So they give you an attestation of, of what everything happened. Uh, and maybe sometime they, they, they actually push that on, so on another piece of software, a uh, hardware that's called a TPM. So the TPM get a, a, a platform attestation of what everything happened till the first uh, firmware that runs on the CPU itself. And then the TPM gets uh, extended with, with uh, other measurements. But that's only one thing that they do. They, the, the root of trust on, on those platforms do a lot of very scary things. Uh, one very important thing to understand is that the, the, they actually power the CPU on. Obviously, you don't want the, the CPU to be running before the root of trust is running. The root of trust is going to be responsible for bringing the whole machine out of reset. That's one of the... It's, nobody knows about this, but they... Well, people know about it, but maybe not everyone knows that. It's a 486, uh, 35 years old piece of CPU that actually brings your, you know, 128 cores, a big iron machine, out of reset. That's what happens in, in all those machines. So power and reset is, is one of the services that it, that it provides. Um, uh, platform attestation, um, uh, UEFI secure boot. So all your uh, secure uh, database where you, you store your uh, UEFI keys and you update those keys, all of this is handled by this piece of, of silicon. Uh, it, has, it has complete ownership on the, on the platform flash where those variables are usually going to be stored. So if you want to update this, eventually you're going to talk to this rule of trust who's going to update those uh, UFI uh, uh, variables. Uh, authenticated debug, if uh, you're uh, if Facebook or Google and you actually want to debug your machine, you want to put it in, a, in such a way that you can actually really look into it, the registers, everything, deep down into, into the CPU. You need to authenticate yourself. That's going to be, that's going to be gated by this rule of trust as well. Uh, manufacturing flows. This is probably, it's, it's probably the most important one where at manufacturing time, when you're actually going to endorse some keys that eventually are going to be proving that your whole secure boot, trusted boot, is actually trusted, uh, this is, the root of trust is going to be handling this at manufacturing time. At manufacturing time, it's going to be provisioned with keys and you want to make sure that you know your CPU is moving between different places in the production chain, actual physical places. So your waffles are, are taken from uh, waffle shorts to uh, 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 manufacturing flows to provisioning flows. They actually physically move. They're touched by human beings that sometimes maybe not that well behaving. You want to make sure that rule trust in specific states completely forbids any keys to be provisioned in your CPU. If I'm on this factory floor and I'm capable of provisioning your root of trust with my keys, then you're, the whole security, the whole security of the cloud is uh, compromised. Let me put it this way. So yeah, the, the root of trust, this small piece of silicon, manage platform flows for very, very critical security things. The boot, uh, security manufacturing flows, updates, authenticated debug. And to, to put it, I, I don't think it's, a, it's an overstatement that say, to, to say that most of the cloud security is actually built on those tiny 32-bit SOCs. And this is where I'm getting to the embedded stuff. This is an embedded, very embedded, well, not very embedded. It, I don't know what very embedded means, but it's a, it's a small piece of silicon running very special software that actually holds the entire security of the cloud, basically. Those tiny 32-bit SOCs, they usually run closed source C and assembly runs. Uh, C, as in most of the time, not very well written C. And assembly, well, it's whatever you want it to be. Those, no, nobody sees these, these, the, those pieces of code. This is the boot run. This is what's, what's actually uh, put into the, 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 the CPU. That's what booting the, the, whole, the whole machine. 
Um, they're, um, they're manufactured from proprietary hardware designs. I'm talking about this 486 uh, uh, real trust in the Intel case. It's not exactly your 486 uh, piece of silicon. It's modified with security, security features, security attributes. And to be, to be fair, nobody has ever seen the 486 uh, RTL, or, or Intel doesn't use RTL, but uh, the equivalent of the RTL. Nobody knows what this is, what, how this is manufactured and, and which gates are running at, at which point of time. And last but not least, uh, how is it tested? What, what, what part of the, of the hardware design is covered uh, by the testing, is it, uh, how is the design validated, how is the software tested, uh, and so on. Nobody knows about this. So your entire cloud security relies on those very tiny uh, SOCs running proprietary, uh, proprietary ROMs and, and, and firmware, uh, manufactured from designs that nobody knows about, and tested by, well, tested, maybe, maybe not. So that's the situation, right? Um, and one may wonder, why should I trust it more? I mean, why should I trust this root of trust more than uh, a well-written piece of firmware running uh, directly loaded in, in, in RAM when you boot? Uh, uh, you know? And to that point, if you go to this link here, uh, Intel Management Engine, and if you look at the CVEs there, uh, the known CVEs um, for, for the, uh, for the uh, Management Engine, which is the Intel uh, uh, root of trust, you're going to be scared. Uh, let me put it this way. Uh, if you understand what, what a management engine, of, of a, a CVE mean, uh, you're going to be scared because it, it basically means if there's a, if there's a, 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 a flow there, a, a severe CVE reported, I mean, entire parts of the, of the cloud are compromised or can be compromised. So yeah, it, it's, it's a real situation. To address that situation, uh, we've seen two projects um, starting uh, for the last few years, uh, Calyptra uh, from, the, from the Chips Alliance, and another one called Open Data. And the goal of this project is to move from this very scary place that we are today with Root of Trust to a completely different one, which is a completely open source hardware design, uh, 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 hardware design from the RTL perspective, the, the, what we call the DV, the design uh, uh, validation, so how your hardware is designed, but how it's also validated. All this is open source. Completely documented, yeah? Hardware documentation, maintained, up to date, so on, yeah, magic, right? And also open source software, open source ROMs, open source manufacturing tools. So those two projects, Calyptra and Open Titan, are basically doing this. And the idea is to say we're going to move from the, the situation we're today to a completely transparent, open, and trustworthy development process for silicon root of trust. And, and today I'm going to talk a, a little bit more about uh, Open Titan. And just a, a disclaimer: uh, I'm, 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 I'm not new to Open Titan, but I've been I've been working in it for for a few months only. Um, I'm I'm a small contributor to Open Titan, so. Don't take my words as uh, authoritative, uh, uh, you know, words on the on the project. They're not. It's just uh, I'm, I'm just talking about what I know so far about Open Titan, because uh, I, I really like the project and I think it's a it's a really refreshing view on Silicon of Trust in particular and on hardware in general. Uh, and let me let me try to describe this. So first of all, the uh, Open Titan is the is the largest open source hardware project out there. There's no other hardware open source project that is, that is actually bigger than this, which is quite an achievement already. Um, you may have heard about uh, Google Titan, which is uh, Google's uh, 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 root of trust. Uh, it's different from Open Titan, so uh, people may think that Open Titan is kind of a, a Google's Titan taking into open source, uh, like they did for uh, a few other uh, pieces of software. But it's not the case. Um, open Titan was started by, by Google but it was started fresh. So it's a completely uh, a, a new implementation of a, a root of trust. So it shares almost nothing. That there's, according to, to uh, Google, there's almost no, almost no uh, 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 intersection between Google's Titan and the Open Titan project. And to put it in, in a few words, uh, Open Titan aims for a, a building a transparent and high quality reference design for silicon root of trust. And high quality is, is very important here. Um, and well, I'm, I'm going to try to describe why. And if you look at the, uh, 
On the left, it's, it's basically the, the current state of uh, uh, rule of trust. Uh, if you look at the uh, kind of the hardware uh, uh, stack from manufacturing up to uh, uh, runtime. Basically, the only two open things that you can get today from uh, root of trust, if you buy a proprietary root of trust, you're going to get a set of APIs to talk to it, some protocols, uh, and a PCB, a, a schematic. Anything in between, it's going to be completely closed. You don't know which firmware it's running. You don't know the instru instruction set that, it, that it's actually running. It, you know, your vendor can tell you this is a, a, a RISC 5 or a MIPS or whatever. You don't really know. Uh, you don't know about the microarchitectural implementation. Uh, does it do branch prediction? Uh, does it speculate? What, how deep is the pipeline? Uh, you don't know in, any of this. What's the cache uh, architecture? None of this is, is known. Um, the, the, the peripherals, the, the, the IP blocks, uh, all of this is proprietary as well. You, you, don't know, you don't know how your crypto engine is designed. You, you have no idea about this. Is it secure? Maybe, maybe not. And security, it, it, you can define what secure means. And you, but you cannot define it if you cannot see the, the RTL. How is it verified? RTL verification, uh, DV, this is all proprietary. Open Titan is not perfect, but it does open quite a few uh, things on, on this stack. The firmware is open, the instruction set is open, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the core of the Open Titan SOC is run a, a completely open uh, ISA. The microarchitecture is completely open, so the, the, the design of the, of the SOC is fully available. All the IP blocks uh, are also completely open, and how you validate those IP blocks, all the DV flows and tests and test benches, this is all uh, completely open as well. So that's quite a change, it's a, it's a, it's a refreshing change. Um, so Open Titan is, is open hardware, and it's open hardware for real. Uh, we've heard about open hardware and, and people claiming that they start doing, they're opening the hardware and so on. Open Titan is, is a really good open source citizen. Uh, if you go to GitHub where all this is maintained, you're going you're gonna to see it by, by yourself. So each and every piece of code, and by piece of code, I, I don't mean only software or firmware. Each and every piece of RTL, very log for IP blocks, for microarchitectural changes, for ISA extensions, for anything, it's a pull request. And for those of you who've, who've worked with hardware designer, hardware implementers, hardware engineers, thinking about RTL changes being an actual Git pull request is mind-blowing. Yeah, I see people smiling because they know, they know what I'm talking about. And it's completely unseen, at least to me. So it's really refreshing. It's pull request that gets sent to GitHub, and they actually reviewed. So it's not only you know, this dude that's been working on, on this specific IP block for 35 years and make a change on a signal there. It has a three nanosecond delay here, and the, and the commit message is uh, like, this works, and just merge it. It's, if, if you do that with Open Titan, you have no chance to get your changes merged. So you need to justify why you change your RTL and your microarchitecture and everything. So it's pull request, which is already quite a change, and they're actually reviewed. Wonderful. Um, Testing and documentation, this is a requirement. So you, you cannot merge something without its, its uh, DV, its uh, digital validation, and it has to be documented. So that's, it, it's completely enforced. There's a CI, there's a CI on, on Open Titan. So your RTL changes are gonna be running through a, a simulation. They're gonna be tested on a bench, on a bench of FPGAs. They're gonna be tested on uh, uh, emulation, uh, QMU. It's a full and, and very thorough CI. And you can actually look at the dashboard and see how much your PR is covering uh, of, of, your, of your overall uh, uh, design. Coding style is enforced. You, you read their, their very log, and it actually sometimes makes sense, at least to me, not, not everything. <laughs> it's Apache 2 license by default, and the, the, uh, the exceptions are allowed, but it's a, it's, it's a real open source license. And the governance and the development process is also completely open. So you know who the technical committee is, who can review and, and uh, approve your changes. Everything is completely open. And one interesting thing about it, uh, this also is that the, the, the hardware, the software, and, and DV, the DV is uh, the, the validation, the, the, the testing, and documenting, documentation, they all develop together, uh, which, is, which is very interesting because it, it, I mean, you. Imagine this, you have up-to-date, fully documented pieces of hardware. What, what do you, I mean, 
who's seen that? I, I haven't. So you, you never get to merge or change an IP block without its corresponding DV. It's software library. So if you, if you bring a new IP block into a new peripheral into Open Titan, you actually need to implement a C library for uh, your firmware your, you run to actually use it. Think about it. And the documentation is, is also most of the time auto-generated. Open Titan has a very strong focus on security. So um, when, when you add or, or extend a new peripheral, a new IP block, uh, everyone needs to, to identify. Uh, when you do that, you need to ident identify the critical assets that this peripheral is going to be manipulating. Uh, and then you need to define explicitly which security countermeasures you're going to need to apply to those assets. So it's a, it's a JSON file with, where actually all the assets that your IP block is touching are described, and each and every countermeasure for each and every of those assets that your IP block implements are described as well. So if you're touching a key, uh, you, you're going to have to explain how you protect that key from security physical attacks, from, uh, for, from any kind of attack. And validation can actually verify that this is implemented in your design. And before merging in all this, you can, people can actually come and say, there are not enough countermeasures. We, we need more than this, right? All, all peripherals, peripherals, all IP blocks uh, can define security alerts. So you can implement your, your IP block, and you can define what is a security alert, and, and, and basically have a physical signal between your IP block and the CPU to actually alert the CPU and let it take a decision about what it should do with your AES engine that's actually alerting you about something really weird and funky going on. All bus transactions are integrity protected, all memory has crumbled, um, and all keys are by default protected from software. So software will not see uh, your protected keys. Um, comportable IP blocks. Um, so all the IP blocks, um, comportable IP blocks is an open Titan a term. It's basically IP blocks. I call that IP blocks that behave, nice behaving IP blocks. Um, and that basically means that, that it's mostly about compliance. Compliance between, between the IP blocks themselves. So if you have your, uh, your key manager, for example, talking to your uh, crypto engine, uh, they need to talk to each other. And they, they physically need to talk to each other. It's, they're not going to go through the CPU. So you need to have a set of external definitions for those two IP blocks to completely work together, be, be compliant between themselves, and also be able to say, I'm going to move from this version of the AES, AES engine to a new one. And if the new one actually has the same behavior as defined by the comportable definition, they're just going to work together. So you can plug and play IP blocks and change them. And this is, this is all described through a, an actual configuration file where each and every IP block de describe its clocks, its buses, uh, the interrupts that it can generate, the alerts that it can generate, all the security countermeasures that I talked about, all the registers that it exposes through, uh, through MMIO. And for example, the, the, the Open Titan documentation on an, each and every IP block is auto automatically generated from this file. So you get a completely up to date a registered definition of your IP blocks with the, with the comments that comes in, the, in this configuration file. So you take all these IP blocks, all these uh, components together, comportable components, you put them together, and this is the high-level view of one possible design for OpenTitan. So this is OpenTitan discrete, so also called uh, uh, all gray. Uh, discrete as in it's a root of trust that you can put in a USB key, and this is uh, the, the current use case. Uh, there's, uh, you can take those IP blocks to define something else called OpenTitan integrated, which is something that's going to be that's currently being defined, which is kind of similar to this with a few a few uh, uh, blocks removed, a few other added, uh, and put together into another top level for OpenTitan. But it's still OpenTitan because it's it's basically mixing and matching all these IP blocks together with the same core. Uh, and the core is, uh, is that one. It's, uh, it's an IBEX core. Um, so if you look at the top uh, left corner here, that's the IBEX, the IBEX core. This is one of the core that's running in there. There's another one, which is the OTBN. It's a big number core that you can run, where you can run 
um, big numbers uh, in, uh, firmware. But the main core of, the, of OpenTitan is IPEX. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simple, it's a very simple, verified, and production-ready RISC-5 32-bit uh, core. It's open source as well, so you can go and, and, and look at the RTL uh, specification for uh, RTL implementation for, for this core. Uh, it's a very simple pipeline, three stages, nothing fancy. Uh, they do brand prediction optionally. By default, there is no branch prediction, so it's a, it's a slow piece of silicon, and that's fine. It's a very simple one. There's no speculation, and, and you, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, in OpenTitan, uh, it, it's a two lockstep core. So there's one core that's running the instruction, and every time you run an instruction, you can verify that the other one that's running the same instruction is in the same state. So if there's a physical attack on your, on your uh, root of trust, then most likely one of them would be desynchronized with the other one, and you can, you can actually take uh, measures when that happens. It does uh, support uh, physical memory protection, uh, EPMP, in order for uh, defining physical, memories, uh, physical uh, uh, memory regions where you can uh, uh, define attributes. So for example, uh, you want to define where your boot ROM is and is it capable of uh, uh, being, uh, can you write on your boot ROM? Or can you execute from your boot ROM? Which part of your boot ROM can you, can you execute and so on? Uh, software. Uh, well. I, people call it different ways, software, firmware, ROM, it's, it's, to me it's a piece of C code. I, I mean, I come from the software world and I'm, I'm, I'm working on that project now, so for me it's just software. Um, it, software, um, OpenTitan uh, relies on the three-stage uh, secure boot, so you have three main pieces of firmware uh, that runs uh, on, on, on OpenTitan. The ROM is in gates, so it, it's really in the CPU. It's a piece of memory that contains the actual code that you compile and, and really provision at manufacturing time. So this is completely immutable code. If you have a bug on your ROM, you go back to your factory, you go back to waiting for nine months, and you get a new CPU with bug hopefully fixed. That's what ROM is about. It's in gates, immutable, and it better be simple, very, very simple C code and some assembly. You need some assembly because you basically boot from scratch, bare metal. Um, the ROM boot, the ROM it tries to keep things very simple, then boot the uh, ROM extension. The ROM extension is the first mutable piece of code, it comes from Flash, and it basically extends in features and capabilities the ROM. You want to keep the ROM very simple. Sometimes it's too simple to, to actually do the, the full boot, so you put more complex pieces into your ROM extension, why you do that? Because you actually can update it in Flash. So you can, it's in Flash in the, in the, in the root of Flash, you don't need to go back to your factory and rebuild a new CPU just because you have a bug on your, on your ROM. And the last one is, is the actual firmware, it's the, the resident firmware that's gonna run all the root of Flash services that, I'm talking, that I've talked about, platform attestation, uh, uh, manufacturing flows, power on, and so on. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an OS, it's a full OS, it's, uh, for example, a Hubris or Zephyr, uh, and, uh, this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, complex OS compared to the ROM and, and the ROM extension. Um, the OpenTitan provides reference implementation for the ROM and, and the ROM uh, extensions. So it's written in C in, in assembly. Uh, it's what OpenTitan called hardened C. So they have some sort of uh, uh, CFI implemented in CE, so they verify that, uh, um, you can verify that uh, your actual code flow is, is what, what's expected, and if it's not, you don't boot. Um, uh, it uses a bunch of uh, peripheral drivers that OpenTitan also provides. So if you want to rewrite your ROM, you can use the peripheral drivers that have been tested and verified. Uh, and, and if you come to think about it, this ROM, the, the ROM, this thing that is in gate, that is very small and simple, this is your root of trust. This is the thing that you need to trust for everything else to be trusted on your, on your platform. If you, trust, if you trust your ROM, ROM loads and verifies the ROM extension, here in that picture, we load and verify the ROM extension, which in turn load and verify the, the, the uh, root of trust firmware, which in turn loads and verify the first CPU firmware. So the real root of trust in, in those kind of CPUs 
is this piece of silicone out there, the, the ROM, the actual, uh, how do you call it, gate ROM. Um, the root of soft firmware, it, uh, Open Titan doesn't provide any uh, uh, reference implementation for this. They provide a like, very simple test for running on top of the, of the ROM extension. Uh, it's a full OS, so it's, it's really up to what people want to do with the root of trust. And as a matter of fact, you could, you could use Open Titan to do something else than a root trust. If you need to uh, use a, 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 an SOC that's secure by default uh, with a bunch of hardware implemented uh, security countermeasure, that's probably a, a good option. Um, the, other, um, the other IP block that I briefly want to talk about is the key manager, because I, I started uh, this presentation about you know, this whole secure boot flow and how you can trust uh, what's running below, uh, the, the junk that's running below your application. And the key manager is really the, the, the IP block that implements uh, the whole, that basically your whole secure boot and, and the whole security of your, uh, uh, your, your platform is gonna be, depend on the key manager. And the key manager um, has a few key slots that uh, can define that as a set of parameters. And the first thing that the, uh, uh, if we take the example of the last step here, Last step below, uh, at, the, at the bottom of this uh, diagram, where the, the root trust firmware, the resident firmware that's running on, the, on, the, on Open Titan, loads and verifies the CPU firmware, let's see what happens with regards to the, uh, to the key manager. So the root trust firmware, uh, the first thing it does is uh, uh, measures the, the CPU firmware that's in flash. And again, the platform flash is now owned by the silicon root of trust. So the root of trust measures this uh, CPU firmware, then it loads this measurement into the key manager, so there's a software input set of registers for the, the, the firmware to actually load those measurements. And then it asks the key manager to derivate a new key, a new identity for the CPU firmware. And this new identity is going to be based on a previous identity, the ROM extension identity, which is based on a previous identity, which is the ROM. It's called DICE, and we, we talked about this uh, previously. So the key manager is going to be asked to derivate a new key, a new identity, for your CPU firmware that's going to be based on your ROM, uh, your roof of firmware, that's based on the ROM extension, that's based on your ROM. So you have your initial trust chain that's built up there. The key manager is going to take uh, your, your uh, key uh, that's, again, derivated from all the other components that booted the, the, the rule of trust, your software input, which is the, the measurement of your CPU firmware, and it's going to derivate this into a new key, which is going to be your CPU firmware. The first firmware that's going to run on your CPU is going to be its identity. And that's going to be what you have to trust. This key uh, is going to be used for signing a certificate in practice, an X509 certificate usually, uh, that actually describes the entire set of measurements uh, that, that uh, you, you, you built uh, during your boot flow. So that's what I'm describing here. Um, the, the key manager really, uh, what I was trying to say is that the key manager is, is the hardware support for implementing DICE in the Open Titan, uh, the Open Titan implementation. And the root of trust firmware is the, the DPE, which is the uh, DPE is the, uh, a new specification for DICE. It's, it's the DICE protected environment. Uh, the root firmware implements the DPE and uses the key manager to actually derivate identity from the root of trust itself, which is the ROM up to the first, uh, the first firmware that's loaded in the, in the CPU. So each boot stage gets a signed certificate chain from the previous boot stage. It measures the next stage, which is, for example, the ROM, exten the ROM extension is going, to be, is going to be measuring the, the, the root soft firmware, the root soft firmware is going to be measuring the CPU firmware, and these measurements gets added as a new certificate node in the chain, in the certificate chain, and passed to the next, to the next uh, stage. So that's how the root source firmware provides the whole attestation report. And once the CPU firmware is booted, there are basically two options. Uh, either the, you, the, the, the root source continue loading each and every piece of, of, of firmware that boots the, the CPU, including, for example, the kernel, or the, the root source provisions uh, a discrete uh, piece of silicon, like a TPM, with the attestation report that it built up to the first firmware, uh, piece of firmware that booted the, the, the CPU. And then this, the, the, this piece of firmware measures the next stage and extends the TPM. And then your TPM contains the whole certificate chain. 
So when you interrogate the, the, the TPN, you get part of the certificate chain that's, that's been signed by your CPU vendor, and then part of your, CPU, uh, of your certificate chain by, that is signed by your TPN. Two things that you can, in theory, trust, hopefully. So I'm running out of time, so a few takes away, takeaways. Um, security is hard. Uh, it is hard. Uh, it, that Open Titan is not really changing this, but it's just making it easier uh, because it's a truly open source uh, uh, hardware project. Uh, and really, I, I, I really believe that open source silicon root of trust can make the cloud a, a little less scary than what it is today. Um, so if you want to participate, this is all on GitHub. Uh, if you really want to, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's really refreshing. If, you, if you've been working with hardware uh, engineers in the past, you go there and you, you, it, it's nice. Uh, so you can participate, you can uh, add documentation. If you know Verilog or System Verilog, you can actually write some code and, and make it open source as well. Uh, you can run um, the Open Titan uh, sil silicon on an FPGA, so there's a bunch of FPGAs that actually support it, so you can, you can synthesize this when, and run it on, on your FPGA. You can even emulate it, uh, so we contributed a, a, a QME implementation for Open Titan, so if you go to that, uh, to that uh, repo here, you can start QMU with the generated uh, um, uh, ROM, and it's going to run the ROM on top of QMU. So it's a very fast way of developing uh, new, uh, new IP blocks. And that's, that's all I have. So I think I have a few minutes for questions. Sorry, I took a little bit too long. But... So if you scroll back a few slides where you saw the architecture, the, so the key man, no, no, the, you, this one? Yes, this one. So shouldn't the key slot derivation from the UDS be outside the key manager? Because what Dai says is that this should be isolated and alone and you should derive a key and forget that part. The, so the, 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 the actual implementation is at, at boot time, it's, I'm, I'm going to get into details here, but the, there's, there's another piece, there's not, another IP block that's called the, the lifecycle manager that basically m manages the, 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 the root of trust lifecycle. And one of the things that it does is going to bring the, uh, the key manager out of reset and tell the key manager, now you can actually do and latch your UDS from OTP. Okay. Key manager is going to do this, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to latch the UDS uh, from OTP and very soon after this, the ROM is going to ask for the first derivation. The ROM is going to boot and, and jump to the ROM extension okay. and derivate UDS. So it's basically isolated, right? And it's then isolated, it's but it's more than this. Yeah, what, okay. After the first derivation, the key manager wipes the key slot for the UDS. So it's, it's gone. It's over. All right. Thanks. Sure. Thank you for your great talk. Um, one question I have is, do you guys have any plans to allow end users to provision their own keys? Um, so for context, um, in the Chromium OS uh, security model, they used to have these, the, the keys stored on the spy flash. And um, basically, they used the write protect pin to um, make sure that th that couldn't be changed um, when the device was used normally. But if people wanted to like open it up and unscrew that write protect pin, they could then provision their own keys. And I think that's very beneficial um, in one side because you don't necessarily want to trust the vendor's key to provide you security, but also because um, if we want kind of devices to uh, last for a long time and maybe to be reused, uh, we also kind of need a way to be able to really rewrite the yep. software and give them like a second life, second use case, stuff like that. So maybe something with a pin could work like this, or is there thoughts? So, so there's, I mean, it, if you own this device, you, you're, you're supposed to be able to use your keys, and, and it, so it, it, it makes sense. And there's a, there's a whole, um, uh, it's called the, uh, uh, ownership transfer. Uh, it's a, it's, and this is also driven by the, the lifecycle manager, where you can, and this is really uh, for, the, the typical use case is for you have a, your Dell or your HPE of the world that actually they, they don't want the CPU, uh, the CPU, the, the, the silicon vendor to actually own the keys of the root trust. This is a device that they're going to sell to the customer, so they want, the, they want to own the keys there. So there's a whole ownership transfer protocol that's de defined for actually doing exactly what you described, where basically you boot 
and you, you provided that the, 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 the silicon creator, the, the CPU vendor, allows for ownership transfer, you're going to be able to completely transfer your ownership and put your keys there as the root keys. So if your if you're PC manufacturer allows, allows you to do this, basically it tells, says the, the keys that's on the, the, the flash that my customers has put, I want to transfer my root of trust ownership to this key, then it's going to be possible, yes. So, and it can be done at uh, post-manufacturing. It doesn't have to be on, on, on the factory floor. So yes, it's, it's a perfectly valid use case and it, it, it makes complete sense. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, you talked about being able to use different firmwares on the Open Titan project. Do you know if there are already some implementations that are starting to the work so that you can have a complete solution for root of trust? And uh, if not, what would be the requirements for the firmware, typically in terms of maybe certifications or, or things like this? I, I think you're talking about the, the yeah. root of trust firmware, right? Uh, um, I, don't know, I don't know of any uh, open source implementation out there. I know that we are going to, we are open sourcing ours. So Revos, we, are, we, are, we have our root of source firmware, and this is going to be open source. So here you go. Uh, there's going to be one at least. Okay, but I don't you. know of any other. I know, I know of, of multiple uh, uh, OEMs that actually implement uh, OpenTitan, and they, they must have their root of source firmware, but I, I don't think they, they have this as, as an open source uh, implementation. But we will. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, are there actual uh, big iron CPU vendors that committed to using OpenTitan, or so can I buy silicon with OpenTitan on it? Uh, yeah, you can buy. Oh, with OpenTitan, yes, you can buy. It, but it, they're all discrete stuff, so they're like, as I said, kind of USB keys, uh, kind of things. Um, they, you, uh, as far as I know, I, I actually don't know, but uh, the, 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 there's not known like big iron CPUs that actually use OpenTitan in its integrated form today. So this is it, the OpenTitan, the, so this is the discrete one where you can actually put that on, on behind a USB uh, a bus, right? The other version is the OpenTitan integrated. And one very important thing here is that you, you see that the, the flash here, there's a flash in the board, right? This is where your ROM firmware and, and all this is going to be running. In an integrated use case, you, you do not want to have the flash on, on your silicon roof flash. You want to have the flash on your platform and be maintained separately. Uh, so the, the integrated uh, version of OpenTitan is slightly different. And this is the one that's going to be integrated into a big iron and, and larger CPUs directly as, as the roof flash. But I don't know of any implementation so far. Okay, so currently with Revis, what your company does, it's like a TPM? Or? Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, on the question uh, you, you had on the, how to manage uh, the keys, I have good news on this front for regular server users because I had the chance to work with a big uh, manufacturer, which is named HP. And on the latest generation, now you can, in fact, the um, the root of trust is derived from the BMC, which is another embedded system, the base mode uh, controller. And on the latest generation, now instead of having the proprietary ILO, you can run open BMC. And their implementation is by default, you have the HP keys on the TPM like for the BMC, but even for a single user uh, buyer, a single system unit buyer, uh, HPE is able to defer you the root of trust, and so you can send yourself your BMC, which is then used to do the root of trust for the whole system. And it's a great achievement. Um, I'm very proud we worked on this with them. But for any Linux user or Windows user, now you can run your own root of trust on your system, even for an SMB market or a single user. Um, so I have two questions about the hardware uh, design. So the first one is about the, the key manager. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that uh, once you reach the CPU firmware, um, you basically have two options. Either you give the, 
the, the CPU firmware key that you can then use to derive its own certificates, or you uh, basically check everything through that uh, root of trust firmware. Uh, uh, sorry, I didn't hear the I didn't hear the last part of your question. Yeah, so, so you had two alternatives, right? Either you you give a key to the oh, CPU, yeah, 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 yeah. the application so, process, yeah, basically, it, or, or, or you go back to Open Titan. Uh, yes, and Open Titan has to do the verification itself. It, yes, has to do the verification and the the, the, the certificate chain maintaining and building. Yes. Yes. Uh, why isn't there a solution in between where the key manager would be exposed to the DAP and DAP and the different boot stages running on DAP would talk on to the On the DAP, you mean the... The, 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 the CPU, yeah. The, the, where, where the, the CPU? host CPU? The host, yeah. Oh, uh, because... So this is, I mean... I wouldn't want the host CPU to be, to be directly accessing the, my, my key manager, uh, for sure. I, I, the, the, the actual uh, uh, IBEX, the, 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 the SOC core here, this one does, does not access the key manager directly. The only thing that, uh, it's, a, it's a completely standalone piece of, piece of silicon that runs and, and is driven by the, by the, the, the firmware, but the, the, the CPU itself cannot access the, the, the key registers or anything. It's just, it's completely isolated there. Yeah. But you mean by, uh, by accessing, accessing the, 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 the key manager as, a, as an interface? Yes, sending requests. So that's, that's one thing I really like from the, the TP, DPE spec is that I thought that it would be possible to take measurements on the CPU, yeah. then send them to some hardware and yes. never have the, the keys. Uh, yeah, yeah, in, absolutely. In the software. So the, the, in, in the DPE case, the, it, the architecture that we're building is that the, the key manager is basically uh, uh, holding the, the key derivation function and the storage of the keys. Okay. Yeah. The rest of the DPE is, is implemented by the, by the, the root of trust firmware. And the root of trust firmware exposes some interface to the, to the host, a PCI interface or something. And the host can actually talk to the root of trust firmware as the DPE. I see. So the, the root of trust, in the, in, the, in the second case where you don't have a DPM, right? Yeah. In this case, if you, if you, uh, if you trust the, the root of trust for doing all your, your uh, DPE stuff, your derivation, then the root trust firmware exposes itself as the DPE. And basically, you have to implement DPE-ish APIs for, for the host to actually interrogate it. Yeah, perfect. <coughs> Excuse me. And, okay, so my second question is about uh, the, the reason for having to design the, the, the CPU almost from scratch. Uh, is that just because you want to be sure that you can trust it? Or do you use, um, I'm vaguely, aware of RISC-V allowing extensions to, to its ISA? Is that something you use? Is that the reason why you're designing the CPU? You, you mean why it's, it's written from scratch? The, yeah, yeah, this, this CPU? Yes, yeah? instead of taking It's actually not shot. written from scratch. It's, a, it's, it's based on a, on a project called uh, Pulp. It's an it's a academic project. Uh, and it, it's based on, it's not, it's not been completely rewritten from scratch. It's, right. it's been designed from Pulp, uh, simplified and with some features removed for security purposes. So it's not, it's a, it's a completely uh, RISC-5 uh, uh, RIS 32-bits compliant, uh, compliant as in, I mean, it, it tells you which extensions it, it implements. Yes. As, as all RISC-5 CPUs, it, it has implemented a set of, a very narrow set of extensions, and it's, that's, that's pretty much it. But the core here is based on something that existed before, if, if that's your question. Yeah. Right, right. So it's still general purpose and... Oh yeah, it's completely general purpose, yes, yes. It, it is very, very much general purpose and very simple. It's, it's, it's verifiable, so it's, it's, it has to be very simple. Okay, thank you, Samuel. Sure, thank you.